Uranium powers both nuclear reactors and nuclear bombs. Uranium is mined in the United States, Canada, Russia, Southern Africa, Australia, and other locations. The ore is refined and uranium is shipped around the world in a form called yellow cake, so called because of its color and consistency. The yellow cake, a compound of uranium and oxygen, can be converted into pure uranium. Uranium is a shiny metal, almost twice as heavy as lead. Most chemical elements have more than one isotope, which means atoms that are essentially identical chemically but have very slightly different weights. Almost all of the weight of an atom is in the nucleus. The weight of the atoms is measured by atomic mass units, which is simply the total number of neutrons and protons in the nucleus. In the case of uranium, natural uranium is made up predominantly of two isotopes, uranium-238 and uranium-235. More than 99% is the heavier isotope, uranium-238. The lighter isotope, uranium-235, is just seven-tenths of one percent of natural uranium. But it is this isotope that is needed for nuclear reactors and for nuclear bombs. To be useful, the concentration of uranium-235 has to be increased. To fuel a nuclear reactor, the uranium should be about 5% uranium-235. To power a nuclear bomb, the uranium should be 80 or 90 or even 95% uranium-235. Increasing the concentration of uranium-235 is called enrichment, and several methods have been used in the past. By far the most important method in use today is the gas centrifuge. Remarkably, for a metal that is so heavy, uranium forms a compound that is a gas. One atom of uranium can be combined with six fluorine atoms to form uranium hexafluoride. At room temperature, uranium hexafluoride is a white crystalline solid, but if heated just a bit, it forms a gas. Fluorine is unusual because it has only one isotope. Every atom of fluorine weighs exactly the same. So any difference in the weight of the uranium hexafluoride is due to differences in the weight of the uranium. And that small difference, less than 1%, allows the two isotopes of uranium to be separated using a centrifuge. The heart of gas centrifuge is a long hollow cylinder called the rotor. Rotors are between 1 meter and 4 meters long and between 10 and 30 centimeters in diameter. Either end of the rotor is capped. The rotors are always mounted vertically so they won't sag under their own weight. The rotor is held in place by bearings at the top and bottom. Just below the rotor lie magnetic coils, and the coils and the bottom of the rotor together form an electric motor. When power is supplied to the coils, the rotor begins to turn, and it turns very, very fast. The rotor may be turning tens of thousands of times per minute. The outside of the rotor can be moving faster than the speed of sound. To reduce the friction with the air, and to protect the surroundings in case the rotor flies apart, each centrifuge rotates inside of a steel casing. Most of the air between the casing and the centrifuge is pumped out, leaving a near vacuum. The rotor is spinning so fast that the g-forces near the outside can be a million times stronger than gravity. This force can be used to separate mixtures of heavy and light materials, like separating cream from milk. If some uranium hexafluoride gas is put into the rotor, the concentration of the slightly heavier uranium-238 will be slightly increased near the rim, and the concentration of the lighter uranium-235 will be slightly increased near the center of the rotor. This effect is tiny, but there's a trick to greatly increase the degree of separation. If one end of a pan of water is heated, the water there rises and cooler water comes in to replace it, setting up a convection current. The same thing will happen if one end of the centrifuge is heated. Keep in mind that up in this case is toward the center of the centrifuge and down is toward the rim. Heating one end of the centrifuge creates a convection current. While the general flow of the gas is along the wall toward the hot end, and along the center toward the cool end, individual molecules of uranium hexafluoride are actually bouncing between the two flows, sometimes going one way, sometimes another, but in general, the heavier uranium-238 will spend a little bit more time along the wall, being pushed along in that direction, and a little less time along the center, being pushed along in that direction. The slightly lighter uranium-235 will be just the opposite, 
spending a little more time being swept along the center and a little less time being swept along the wall. This means that the heavy and light uranium separates not between the rim and the center, but between one end and the other, with the heavy uranium-238 collecting at the warm end and the lighter uranium-235 collecting at the cool end. Tubes running along the center of the centrifuge pull out the gas that is enriched in uranium-235. Of course, gas taken from the opposite end is now slightly depleted in uranium-235. One centrifuge doesn't separate very much uranium, and it doesn't enrich the uranium very much. To get more throughput, many, sometimes thousands, of centrifuges are operated in parallel. To get the necessary enrichment, the output of one set of centrifuges is put into another set of centrifuges for further enrichment. This is called a cascade. A cascade might require several stages to get the necessary level of enrichment. A nuclear reactor requires a great deal of uranium, but with a small enrichment. So cascades to produce reactor fuel will be broad and have only a few stages. Much less uranium is needed for a nuclear bomb, but the enrichment needed is much higher, so the cascade will not be as broad, but will have more stages. The centrifuges can be exactly the same machines. This is the problem with the Iranian centrifuge plant, or any centrifuge plant for that matter. Even if it is producing fuel for peaceful nuclear reactors, it can quickly be converted to produce uranium for nuclear bombs.